Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session, which is just one session in today's Integrated Marketing Virtual Conference for Nonprofits, brought to you by the Integrated Marketing Advisory Board. Before we get started, we would take a moment to thank our conference sponsor, Give Together, for helping us bring this conference to you at no charge. We also want to thank our media sponsor, The Nonprofit Times, for helping us get the word out about this unique conference and providing feedback on conference session content. We also like to thank Paradise for sponsoring this session specifically. During this session, please feel free to submit questions in the chat box to your GoToWebinar window. This session speaker will answer questions toward the end of the session. So with that said, I'll turn this over to you, Bethany. Great. Thanks so much, Josh. Uh, welcome everybody to our session this afternoon and uh, since for those of you on the East Coast we're here in the kind of mid and post lunch hour we decided to talk about food for the next hour so um, this is all about peanut butter and chocolate combining digital and traditional channels for integrating fundraising success and I'd love to introduce my partner in crime uh, for both this presentation and uh, great amounts of collaboration and friendship over the years Miss Michaela King. Hello everyone, this is Michaela King. I'm the Vice President of Integrated Marketing at Defenders of Wildlife and I'll be doing a bit of a case study later on in the presentation. Great. Thanks, Michaela. So as Josh mentioned, uh, for those of you who joined us a little late, we want to hear your questions. We may not stop uh, mid-presentation to answer them, but we will definitely answer them um, at the end of our session or over email individually, depending on uh, how our time runs today. So make sure you put your chat questions into the chat box uh, in the window in GoToWebinar. And with that, let's dive into our uh, content for today. So as I mentioned, this is all about food for us. So we want to start out by talking about the raw ingredients, so knowing what each individual channel brings to the integrated marketing recipe. So we're going to go over the basic channels that each of us work in, direct mail, email, social media, mobile, that kind of thing. And then we're going to take a brief look at some of those individual channel combinations and see great ones, questionable ones, and talk about the new rules of the road when combining channels. And lastly, and for the majority of the session, I will turn it over to Michaela uh, to talk about a Defenders of Wildlife case study uh, that involves all of the channels that we talk about here today and the results that they got and how they measured everything. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in. Raw ingredients. We want to look at the strengths and weaknesses of each of the individual channels that we have to deal with as marketers today in the nonprofit arena. So in an effort to keep our food thing going, we wanted to look at what really defined a channel as good or bad at what we ask it to do, whether that convey a stewardship message or convey an appeal for fundraising or for advocacy or volunteer time. So we came up with four elements of channel strength or weakness. The first being timeliness. So when you think about, for example, planning a direct mail campaign, uh, timeliness where you've got variability in in-home date can be a little rough, whereas email, social media can be incredibly timely. Visual appeal is our second sphere of influence uh, in defining a channel strength or weakness. By visual appeal, we mean is this DRTV where you can tell a very personal um, very relatable story with a lot of incredible graphics, or is this more of a, a text-heavy uh, medium like direct mail, uh, where you need to tell a good story but don't necessarily incorporate a ton of graphics? Sphere of influence is another uh, element that we thought defined a channel's strength and weakness, and by sphere of influence we mean is this something that's shareable? So we know that shareable content, if you have listened to any of our earlier sessions today, is becoming more and more important for Gen X and Gen Y. Uh, so social media, great sphere of influence. Uh, direct mail, not as much. And the other, depth of content. So we know in, as a society, we have sort of started developing these two counter habits of content binging and content snacking. Uh, so by content snacking we mean tweets, we mean social media um, posts, things that are incredibly consumable, usually on a mobile device on the fly, um, not the best at telling a complete story. Whereas something like a, a four-page direct mail piece, you can get incredible depth of content in there. Um, as well as series or booklets that you send out to your audience through the mail. So 
taking these four things into consideration really helps you better judge what your channel mix should be based on what you need this channel to do for you. The underlying piece to all of this, however, is your constituent's preference. And that's why, you know, for any of you foodies out there, we talk about the umami um, of a flavor. That means the robustness or the savoriness. Um, it's not a specific taste individually, but it's, it's really the preference and the thing that brings it all together. So that is something that is incredibly important to track and keep in mind as you come up with your medium mix. Michaela, any, anything you want to jump in there on? No, I think it really is, I would say, about um, what each channel, I want, I want folks to keep in mind that one thing in mind that Bethany said, it's about what, each, what you need each channel to do for you, and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses that we'll get into. Great, thanks. All right, so the first channel we want to look at is direct mail, and I will fully admit that I'm a digital specialist here at Paradise and PM Digital, so I'm going to lean heavily on uh, Michaela and uh, maybe my colleagues out in the audience uh, to help with the, the direct mail explanation here. So we know that this is still the best channel to reach certain audiences, definitely the 70 plus mature audience. We obviously can very much target this as a medium based on the lists we buy or rent, as well as within our own house files of who has been direct mail responsive. Um, one of the great strengths of this channel is that the audience will spend a lot of time reading your message um, if you target it correctly. So if the right person is getting the right direct mail piece, they will sit down and read that letter. We know that direct mail is in a singular channel and that um, if any of you are tracking this out there, when you drop a direct mail piece, you will see an inevitable upsurge for a window in your online search uh, and giving around things that are associated with that particular package. It may not be big, but it, it usually is a noticeable little bump. Another one of the things that we love about direct mail, there are no spam filters on the physical mailbox that sits outside your home. So the chances that you're actually going to get that piece into somebody's hand is much greater than in their email box. Now, if it makes it up the stairs and past the trash can in the kitchen, that's another story. So that's where that targeting piece comes in. On the con side, direct mail, as we know, between postage and increased costs is getting very expensive um, for impressions and branding. Again, underscoring that need for being very targeted. Michaela? One of the things that I'd say about direct mail, too, which for a lot of the traditional fundraisers in the audience won't be anything new, is that direct mail is really a fundraising medium. It's not necessarily a reach medium. You can only reach the people that you mail to, and it's not at all easy for somebody to take that mail piece and send it on to their friends or um, you know the people in their circles. Not nearly as easy as it is through digital means. So the primary sort of purpose and functionality for direct mail is um, to, to rally your base and as a fundraising medium. Great. And if there are any questions or comments out there in the audience, please uh, feel free to jump on. We know that direct mail is, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more debate about its place in the integrated marketing space. So we'd love to hear what you guys are thinking. Moving on, our next uh, channel we want to look at individually is telemarketing. So telemarketing has, as we all know, a bad rap. Um, these are the folks that often call at an inopportune time and sometimes not super well trained in the script that you need them to deliver. So the conversation doesn't feel um, very genuine, which is something that is, is very necessary in telemarketing. But if you get the right script in the right firm and it's well carried out, this can be an incredibly valuable channel. It's lower cost uh, than face-to-face -face canvassing for acquisition. Again, can target very well, both geographically and demographically. I think one of the very interesting things about telemarketing is that it allows you to I should say, quote unquote, personally follow up with your existing constituents. So if you are trying to upsell someone on a sustaining gift effort or if someone has advocated for you and you want to ask them for a donation for that campaign, this is a great way to actually put a voice to that constituent and thank them for their existing involvement with your organization. 
along that same line, one of the great things is that it's easy to tailor the conversation in real time based on someone's feedback, answer their questions as they come up. Again, really important to pick the right firm to do this type of telemarketing for you and to make sure that your scripts are seamless and incredibly well written. Michaela? Yeah, I think this goes back to the, the statement that Bethany's already said twice, which is picking the right firm and really having, thinking of the callers, these telemarketing callers, as an extension of the staff that you have talking to your existing donors. I mean, think of, you know, if you have the right telemarketing firm, if you have a really good relationship, if they're really well informed about your issues and they're really good on the phone and good at their job, this can really be something you use and employ as an extension of the staff that are already creating relationships through inbound calls from don to your donor services department about your issues. And so think of it in terms of uh, the quality that you would want if somebody was talking to a staff member about your mission and your issues. And it can really be a, a very valuable medium. Great. Thank you. Next, we want to look at DRTV. Uh, DRTV is definitely a channel that we have seen a resurgence in, in the last two years especially. Um, and this is one of the best storytelling mediums that there is, so highly visual, and you can use first-person stories to, about your mission to really trigger that giving impulse. Um, we've all seen ASPCA does a brilliant job uh, with DRTV. This example here is from Paralyzed Veterans of America. So, if you have a nonprofit that has stories that really can be put in a in a personal context and shown well graphically, this is definitely something to consider. Um, on the negative side, definitely need to consider what the ROI is. This is not a cheap or inexpensive channel to get into. To do the great creative uh, is costly, and that's why you often see almost 100% across the board membership or monthly or staining giving as the ask on DRTV because that's really the only way that the ROI works out is through sustainer or member acquisition where you've got that long-term income and likely a donor that you're going to keep around for five or seven years um, to justify the cost of DRTV. Michaela? Yeah, the other thing I'd say about DRTV is uh, not only is a significant uh, chunk of the expense of this type of a program in the creative, i.e. in creating the actual 30, 60, 90 second spots for your DRTV program, but the lead time for creating those spots is pretty long and the, the planning that's required is pretty significant. And so DRTV is a great channel for a program that you have a really long lead time or a campaign that you have a really long lead time in in planning. It's not a great channel just because of that significant lead time for very rapid turnaround campaigns. So if you learn about a, a you know a bill that's coming up next week in the Senate that your organization wants to fight, it's not a good channel for that because there's no way you're going to be able to put together a video and launch it in time to fight that. So but if you want to fund a new type of service that your organization does or launch a new type of program or something like that that you have a very long lead time on, DRTV could be a really valuable channel for you in that respect. Great. So moving on to email. This is uh, one of my personal favorite channels <laughs> as a digital strategist. It is still largely... Uh, a, a backbone of online fundraising for nonprofits, um, and I think it it gets a, a bit of a bad rap in terms of you've got all of the email is dying, just like you had the direct mail is dying um, a couple of years ago. So don't don't uh, dis on email as a channel individually. It's still a great opportunity to have highly visual and rich content. Um, I think that the onus is really on our creative professionals and nonprofit to take email into the next age of making that wow message really sing in um, a mobile email environment. So you're talking much tighter copy, much uh, shorter calls to action, and obviously graphically something that needs to be as beautiful on a desktop as it is on an iPhone. Uh, so my, my hat is off to our creative colleagues in, in the audience who are tackling this. Um, on the downside email, we all know inbox competition incredibly fierce uh, and 
made much worse by mobile reading. I just got an email today from a, uh, a large event program and um, not mobile optimized, couldn't read it at all. So it's one of those things that um, we are sort of conditioned to automatically delete. Um, you know, we talked about direct mail, no spam filters, uh, and things like that. So inbox you're dealing both with spam filters as well as people are much more picky about what emails they will read and not read because of uh, mobile nowadays. One of the things we love about email is that you can trigger in real time off of action or inaction. So you can always retarget if someone doesn't open or doesn't click through on a link. Um, or if somebody does and they donate, you can put them into the appropriate stewardship series. I think that that's one thing um, that's becoming a bit of a lost art. We really focus on welcome series um, in direct mail a lot of the time, but in email you get sort of thrown into the house file a little too quickly um, in a lot of situations. So taking that time to thank and rethink someone for their donation and really get to know them better to be make your communication more relevant is critical in email. Michaela? Yeah, sure. And I'd say, you know, I think this is true for, the, for many digital mediums, certainly email and the web, but I think with the um, increase in privacy issues and or, or lack thereof of privacy issues, people are getting less and less tolerant of inappropriate or irrelevant uh, messaging to them. So the creative needs to be, the creative, the copy, the targeting all need to be a very, very highly in sync to make sure a person is not getting something that is irrelevant to them to the best of your knowledge. If you don't know, some, know anything about what a constituent is interested in, there's only so much targeting that you can do, but um, by the time that they've opted into your file and taken at least one action or opened at least a couple of emails, you know a little bit about what's going to move them and it's really important to track and to target folks based on that information. Right, absolutely. So going on to the, the close companion of email, social media. Um, and obviously Facebook is the juggernaut here, but uh, don't forget Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, all, all of the channels that we love to uh, take our free time in. And, LinkedIn um, more and more, strangely. LinkedIn more and more, <laughs> Google+. Plus. Um, so this is an area that's really changing in 2014. There are some great thought leadership articles that have come out in the month of January. I highly recommend Googling um, social media 2014 trends uh, if you haven't, because uh, we, we are expecting to see some shifts in this arena this year. But this is about as real time as it gets, and your most vocal supporters have the real time ability to influence the behaviors of those closest to them. So are your detractors, which is why social media can definitely not be, be a set it and forget it medium. Um, this is not necessarily the best way to raise money. Uh, social media, we always consider it sort of the gravy money. If you've got a great campaign or a specific call to action that makes absolute sense for social and you've got that lightning in a bottle, go for it. Most of us do not have that and this is this is your stewardship and engagement channel and also where you can give your brand um, a lot of weight because we're seeing more and more that people will actually be using Facebook as their primary search engine. Um, they're checking out your Facebook content and your user generated content before they're checking out the content that you own. Social is playing a larger and larger role in search algorithms. So that voice of consumer is something you absolutely cannot ignore as it ties to fundraising. So other thing that we love to use social for is if you're struggling to come up with good campaign themes, there is nothing better than social listening. Uh, to see what the people who care about you most actually react to. And it never hurts to ask them. Uh, they will respond. So, Michaela? I think that's really, uh, the, the ask them statement is really the key for social media. Social, it's really important to remember, is a conversation medium. It's not a you talking at them medium. And I think a lot of folks um, from a, uh, from a, philosophical standpoint as well as probably more importantly from a, a staffing support or a support structure perspective um, have a hard time with the idea that social really needs to be a conversational medium. So you're talking with your constituents, very often they're initiating the conversation and it's really important that it needs to be a, a two-way conversation. Just posting stuff on social media is not going to hack it. Um, folks are gonna, really going to recognize that um, recognize and appreciate it when you really engage with them around the issue that you both care about. Perfect. 
now the game changer mobile um, everybody for the last probably two years has said this is the year of mobile but at the end of 2013 we really started seeing those statistics bear out that um, mobile engagement in how people were accessing our digital assets really did overtake desktop assets so the time of mobile is here if your emails etc website aren't mobile optimized need to think about it the other side of mobile is actual uh, push marketing so SMS campaigns things like that mobile is as timely and as clean of a destination as you can get you're not going into an inbox or a mailbox that's overstuffed it is very difficult to ignore text messages um, they're interactive they're trackable but they also need to be incredibly short and very spot-on so doing a good SMS campaign is really dependent on what kind of content you have and what asks you have really applicable around advocacy so Michaela how do you guys use mobile sure so you know that it, it mobile has grown to encompass two different sort of things it started out obviously as just straight you know t SMS text messages going to a user that had signed up to receive them and has grown pretty exponentially to include like Bethany said the use of mobile devices to interact with an organization beyond just the texting environment so texting certainly is still a piece of it we start here at defenders of wildlife we still send out text messages periodically not only to um, to inform and to educate to motivate to fundraise to do all of those things um, to advocate but we also are are putting a really heavy focus on making all of our digital assets mobile optimized which means that you can read them in any environment whether it's whether it be a desktop computer a tablet or your smartphone or a person's smartphone and the idea that content needs to be um, thought of based on how and with what device somebody is going to read it is part of what mobile is nowadays and is really important to think of when you're thinking about your digital assets because more and more people are access, ac accessing them on all kinds of different screen sizes and if you don't take that into account you're going to cut out a pretty significant portion of folks who are trying to learn more about you or trying to to do what you're asking them to do which is to donate or to sign a petition or to watch a video or to to, to tell you how good of a job they're doing or not right so uh, just make sure when you think mobile marketing as a single channel you're talking about not only SMS but mobile content um, and where and how because again um, hats off to our creative brethren in the off in the uh, audience because this has totally changed how we market from a content perspective all right last individual channel that we want to look at before we start combining all of our peanuts with their uh, chocolate partners here so display and search uh, again a very timely medium you can reach your warmest audience through immediate retargeting that is a great baseline investment um, for getting into this channel if you aren't already you can get real-time results uh, one of the beauties of it is really speed of testing I would say uh, of all the mediums that we use this is the one you can optimize the fastest uh, based on results and uh, depending on who you're buying from this is one of the only mediums where you can have flexible payment whether it's cost per impression cost per click things like that so um, it is I think applicable for everybody to get into this medium um, not necessarily for an entire annual plan I know that with a lot of my clients um, and places where I've worked in the past really have to start budget around a test campaign two three months um, things like that so look at what you can afford and um, what your likely conversions are before figuring out how much you want to step into this space but it is one that if you're going to test a concept you will get results very quickly and be able to course correct Michaela that really is the beauty of display and search I mean you know for those organizations that don't know Google has a fantastic nonprofit grants program that gives money away for search engine marketing it's a fantastic way to test out um, with with very little risk really only the staff that's managing at risk uh, to figure out what's working for you what what your organization what 
what your audience wants to know about your organization, what folks are searching on to get to your issues and your the, the mission and the, the issues that your organization works on. And wow, speed of test results is uh, is absolutely true. I mean, you can you know make a campaign go live tomorrow morning and by the afternoon, depending upon your search traffic, have pr a pretty good idea on what type of messaging w is going to work for that campaign and what people are really responding to. And you can set. Um, many, many, many different campaign variations and get very quick results. So this is a fantastic medium to, to test messaging in and that, that can be used to inform other more expensive mediums also. Absolutely. And Michaela, that's a great point as we start getting into how do you combine these channels together is learnings in one really should inform how you deal with things in another. Um, you know, one of our, our buzzwords for 2014 is marketers that we're hearing more and more of is omni-channel. So it's not multi-channel multi anymore, it's not integrated anymore. We're starting to hear of omni-channel, which means behavior in one channel should affect a constituent's experience in the other. And that very much plays to how your creative does and how you carry it through for an individual constituent's experience. So just something to, uh, to keep in the back of your mind as we look at how to combine these channels together. So great taste that tastes great together. Um, and I can't speak for anybody else, but I really can't wait um, for dessert after this. So, all right, great flavor combinations. Michaela, do you want to take this? Sure. So there, these are just a few of the great flavor combinations that we could come up with. There are certainly a whole lot of other ones, but these are different channels that tend to work really well in synchronicity with each other. Um, the first example that we came up with was email cultivation engagement and social media and blog. And so these are both very rapid response channels. They're ones where you can create and deploy a campaign or a blog post or um, a social media uh, post within sometimes just a few hours if you're really fast. Um, and there are things that work, can really work well together with messaging. So think of your standard constituent or think of yourself as a constituent with the organizations or companies that you interact with. If you're on an organization's email list or you follow an organization's blog, chances are if something there is engaging you and you want to further engage with that organization, you may start to do research in what else they're doing and what other channels they're communicating in and you can, um, you can follow them in an email and social media and blog is no different. In an email, you can reference a social media campaign. You can send them to a social media campaign and ask them to do something. You can certainly ask them to follow your blog or follow you on Facebook or Twitter or Pinterest. Um, a blog post can um, compel somebody to take action on an issue that you've been primarily advocating through through email and you can ask them to join your email list to learn more and to take action on other issues that they care about. Another example of a really good pairing is email and mobile fundraising and offline fundraising, especially telemarketing. So um, one of the things that you can um, that you can do to gain synchronicity here is um, in telemarketing asking people to join the email list for more information and for more things to do around the mission that you both care about. Um, mobile fundraising, certainly all three of these things are very rapid response channels, campaigns you can launch very quickly and that can have quite a bit of synchronicity amongst each other. Another good example is print media and email. One of the things Defenders does um, as, a, as a campaign technique fairly frequently is if we want to um, influence legislators or influence state policy or something like that or make constituents in an area aware of an environmental or wildlife issue, we'll very often think of placing an ad in a prominent new newspaper locally. And if we don't have the money to do that, we can reach out to our email audience and launch a campaign to raise the money to place an ad in a local paper, especially if you're targeting the email to the local area where the print ad is going to be placed. It can be a really interesting, fun, um, effective campaign that you can launch to 
um, for, a, for a local population on a local issue or even nationally. Important though in email, really important I would say in any of these channels, but especially in the digital medium, is to follow up on the results of campaigns. So we always, whenever we do a campaign like that, go back and say, here's a screenshot or a snapshot of the ad that you with your donation helped place. We hope you saw it in the paper or send a message out just before the ad is placed or just before the ad is launched, telling them to take a look at the ad in that, that, local, that local paper. Um, some questionable f f flavor combinations. Um, we had some fun coming up with these. I don't know if you can see these pictures, but it's macadamia nuts with Spam, um, bubblegum cocktail weenies, and Mountain Dew and Dorito cupcakes. I, I can probably think of actually a few friends who might actually enjoy that one. <laughs> but some of the questionable flavor, flavor combinations that we came up with were direct mail and blog. I think it, probably the commonality you'll see amongst all of these these uh, good and, and questionable flavor combinations is the timing element. If two channels are really off as far as how rapid response they are or not, that's going to make them more of a questionable flavor combination than if they're much more um, tightly uh, together as far as how quickly you can launch them. So direct mail and blog. Direct mail is primarily a fundraising medium. It's one of those mediums where if you ask people to do more than one thing, they're much more likely not to do anything than if you focus folks on just do, completing the one action that you want them to do in direct mail. And so if you um, are launching a blog post, that's something that you can do fairly rapidly. Direct mail has a really long uh, lead time, and very often by the time a direct mail piece is out, it's not as timely as it would be um, if uh, it was launched in a, in a more rapid response medium. And so direct mail needs, by its very nature, to be a little bit um, uh, needs to be a little bit more general on issues than, um, than timely. Outbound telemarketing and social, there's not really anything these two things right now have, or these two channels right now have to do with each other. If you are, um, as an organization, calling a uh, supporter, you know, you can certainly, you usually have a specific, very specific ask that you're asking them to do, whether it's supporting a campaign or it's, um, you know, calling their representative to register their approval or outrage over um, that representative's um, stance on an issue, and it doesn't really have a lot to do with social. They can certainly engage around the same issue through social media, but the two don't really complement each other or raise each other up in the way that some other channel combinations do. DRTV and mobile are the same way. The DRTV, the, the response channels for DRTV are typically the online through a microsite or inbound telemarketing or a call center, and there really there really isn't um, much of a uh, a similarity in DRTV and the mobile environment. If you're sending out a text message or an email in the mobile environment asking somebody to do something, you probably wouldn't um, you wouldn't provide them information or the video of your DRTV spot. And actually, I saw a question earlier on what DRTV stands for. Apologies for not saying that earlier, but it's direct response television. So it's almost like a commercial that asks somebody to do something. Usually, it's to do to do some sort of fundraising. Right. Stephanie, you so, want to take the, uh, but, but nothing we said is ever set in stone forever? <laughs> right. That's um, one of the beauties of working, especially within the digital realm as marketers, is that there are no permanent rules. The channels themselves as individuals and how they combine together changes on a fairly rapid basis. So we could do this presentation in 18 months, and I guarantee you we would make changes. Um, so there are absolutely no permanent rules, and there are flavor combinations that you look at and you're going, really? But they, honest to goodness, really are fabulous. So um, here's your, your bonus recipe for uh, sticking with us here in this after lunch hour um, before we launch into Michaela's case study. But really want to encourage you to um, subscribe to as many of the, the thought leadership blogs that you can, uh, not only just about fundraising, but about marketing and the channels, getting out of the nonprofit space and looking at how commercial entities are starting to use mobile and social and email and web content marketing and things like that, because that's where we'll see the trends um, as we have trickle into nonprofits, because the commercial uh, 
user experience is kind of what shapes somebody's expectations of how um, they expect their nonprofits to treat them as well when it comes to their marketing campaigns. So something to keep in mind. And just to wrap up this session, section before we go into the case study. I let Michaela catch her breath <laughs> since she will be taking the lion's share of the rest of this content. This is something uh, that you can screen cap uh, anytime you're going through what should my channel mix be for this particular campaign, always start with your audience. So on the left hand side and just work through left to right about what makes the most sense. Are the you targeting people who are cold, they could be interested in your mission or they could not be. Um, people who you know are interested because they have touched your digital assets, they have raised their hand in some way, gone to an event, taken an advocacy action. Um, getting into people who you know want to get involved with the mission, not who just are interested, but somebody who has identified themselves to you in a deeper way. And then don't forget the people who have gotten involved with your mission. So um, the consideration stage there is CODL, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the see, think, do, and CODL, that is from um, Avinash Kaushik, who is the, you know, kind of Google uh, guru in in the world. So highly recommend his blog. But one of the things that I think that we are, are failing to do as a nonprofit industry, we hear a lot about the issues around retention lately. We have failed to coddle. Um, and this isn't just the major donors who are giving you 10,000 above. You need to coddle your everyday donor. And because they give you so much information and in how they interact with your content during marketing campaigns, um, if you pay attention and you set up your, that measurement infrastructure up front, you really can give them a great experience and fix retention. So with that, Michaela, I will hand it over to you for a case study. Thanks, Bethany. So the case study that I'm going to go over is actually from the fall of 2012. Um, for those or, or people who are familiar with Defenders of Wildlife uh, or, or those who are not, we work on endangered species, endangered and threatened species issues in North America. And one of our the big species that we work a lot on are wolves. And uh, so this campaign centered around um, Wyoming specifically as a state. As you know, um, wolves are protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. There's actually a proposal out now to remove that protection, but that's another case study for another time. Um, and uh, this specifically is around um, the, the action to remove wolves in specifically the state of Wyoming from the federal endangered species list, and which means that they would fall into Wyoming state management hands. Wyoming has a, had a state management wolf plan that we as an organization and our scientists deem was not uh, good enough to support uh, healthy wolf populations in the state of Wyoming, and so we were against Wyoming wolves being delisted. And so we launched a multi-channel campaign to, in an attempt to prevent that from happening and to make sure that our key constituencies were aware and were, were aware of this action and were rattling the cages and, and, uh, and having their voices heard as much as possible um, against this happening. So as Bethany said, the first thing we really started off with in planning this campaign was our key audiences. Um, we determined that there were really two major buckets of key audiences that we wanted to involve in this campaign. The first was media, so newspapers, you know, traditional um, press and the media, third-party blogs, um, TV, radio, things like that. And the other um, big constituent bucket that we're really going to focus primarily on today was constituents. So when we think of defenders, we think of constituents, we think of not only donors, but people who could become donors, and we also think of our activists. We have a pretty strong advocacy program, and so our activists are really important to us in being able to get the voice of wildlife heard to their representatives, um, both regionally and nationally. So those are the key audiences that we started off with, knowing we wanted to get involved in this campaign. And from there, we really started thinking about, all right, what is it that we want people to do? What is really going to make a difference with this campaign for, from two perspectives? One is from trying to prevent the delisting from happening in the first place or stalling it as long as we possibly could, and also from funding our work to try to protect wolves in Wyoming in general and all the different ways that we do that. And so. 
what we did in order to start planning this campaign after we had our audiences were taking a look at what channels we had at our disposal, what channels made sense to work into at various uh, stages of the campaign. And our big channels are listed out here on this slide. They're, they're, they're the gears that really make our um, campaign engine work. So obviously our website and, and listed here under each of the channels are sort of what, what we saw in this campaign that these channels were going to be used for primarily. So website was really educated education and amplification of the message of Wyoming Wolf delisting is bad. Social media was really about engaging folks who were supporters of defenders and supporters of our mission and supporters of Northern Rockies and Wyoming Wolves and getting them to getting them engaged in this issue and getting them to speak out on behalf of this action um, or on behalf of wolves and against this action. We obviously do a significant amount of work in email and our primary goals there for those audiences were advocacy and fundraising. Mobile, same thing, both in the mobile environment and through SMS texting, advocacy and fundraising were the big goals with that channel. Our blog was issue awareness. It was, a, it was an opportunity for us to go much more in depth into the specifics of issues and milestones during the campaign than we could in any other channel. Folks stay on a blog and interact with blog content a whole lot longer than they do in just about any other channel. So we can get a little bit more detailed there than we could any other place. And then in the mail and phones, the primary driver there, the primary goal with direct mail and telemarketing was fundraising and, of course, issue awareness. We can't fundraise without folks knowing what the problem is, what the crisis is, and how we're going to try to solve it. So that was the sort of the pieces that went into the campaign. If we take a look at campaign milestones and how we sort of laid the campaign out across the, the months that we had to run it, um, we had a heads up, and this is, you know, this is one of the keys to any campaign is how much heads up do you have about a development happening or um, how, much of it, how much of it does it catch you by surprise. And, you know, we have campaigns that um, or issue developments that um, are all points along that spectrum. But for this one, we didn't know exactly when it was going to happen, but we did know that it was coming down the pike, that Wyoming wolves were going to be delisted. And so we developed, we divided the campaign really into three main segments. The first one was before the delisting actually happens. Our goal there was trying to prevent it. And through conversations with our program staff, we decided that our best shot at trying to prevent or stall the, the delisting from happening was petitioning the White House. Petitioning Obama and trying to get that, that kind of attention. The next chunk of the campaign was after the delisting happened. It was really, what is Defenders going to do next? What do we need our supporters to do? And what does this really mean for wolves in Wyoming? It was really about um, education, awareness, and next steps. And then what's next is, you know, eventually the, the delisting happens, the, the, the fervor of that uh, milestone in the campaign dies down, and we need to keep up the drumbeat of how are we going to long-term protect wolves in Wyoming. So we had contingency plans if this is, was not the, the, uh, the, the course of how the campaign actually happened and if things turned out differently, um, but this is how the actual, the actual campaign sort of went down. So phase one, before the actual announcement happened, this was the trying to stop it from happening um, phase. We didn't think we had a very good chance, um, and it actually did end up being announced, but we did absolutely everything that we could with, together with our supporters to try to prevent it and to stall it from happening. We created some highly visual media as well as a whole lot of copy and other creative that we deployed across all channels to try to get the word out and to get folks to take action and sign a petition and do several other things to get the White House's attention to try to prevent this. Um, we created the first of two videos with our president, that's our pre president, Jamie Rappaport Clark, talking about how much of a, how important it is to protect wolves in Wyoming, and we deployed that video across uh, all of our digital channels. Uh, we sent out a significant number of advocacy actions through email 
and also fundraise through email up as the as the as the campaign started developing. Um, talking about what we did in social media, we also, in addition to the video that we sent out, we created the first of two uh, social sharing images that people could use that went that we hoped and that did go pretty far and wide that people could use to promote across Facebook and Twitter and wherever else they wanted to promote them. We had a pretty significant series of um, tweets and Facebook posts that went out sharing these and asking folks to comment and to share them. And we also promoted the video and the advocacy actions that we were promoting through the um, email channel also. At the same time, we were doing mobile asks, sending us, sending folks within the mobile environment to the social environment to share these images and also to sign the petition. So the petition was really sort of the cornerstone for everything and all of the other things that we were doing were in support of that. Um, along the lines of our goal to try to get the White House's attention, one of the goals of the the, the image sharing was to try to take over to the degree that we could Barack Obama's Facebook page with this. And there was actually a few hours during the campaign, which if you know how um, high trafficked the Barack Obama's Facebook page is, it's a pretty remarkable achievement. Um, we were actually able to get enough folks posting this shareable image and their uh, their um, their unhappiness with the threat of delisting Wyoming's wolves with and leaving them without protection that we were able to take over Barack Obama's Facebook page for a little bit, which was uh, maybe a high point I will think of <laughs> back when, <laughs> on the, at the end of my career. Um, I love that. If we uh, go on to and start talking about phase two, what we had hoped wouldn't happen happened did happen. We didn't think we, uh, we, we thought that was the most likely uh, the case is that the uh, White House would decide to move forward anyway, which is what they did with Wyoming delisting. And on August 31st of 2012, they actually announced that Wyoming's wolves were being delisted and the next day that um, wolf hunts would be starting throughout the state, um, which of course we were very, we and our supporters were very strongly opposed to. We knew that this day was very likely going to happen, although the exact date we didn't know. And so we had planned ahead, which I think is probably the, the key takeaway from this piece, is planned ahead for this happening. And we had an entire um, sort of list of things that needed to be deployed and collateral that needed to be deployed as soon as this announcement came down the pike. And so it's the minute that we got the um, information that this was going to be announced, which was just a few hours before Fish and Wildlife Service announced the actual delisting, we were out to over a million of our supporters and over 500 media outlets with this information, with all of the collateral that we had prepared in advance. So here's a bit of a screenshot on what we were out with within just a few hours. We sent a text message right away as soon as we found out with the urgent message breaking. Um, Wyoming wolves stripped of federal protection. The, the first ask there was a fundraising ask. We deployed the second of our two videos of our president announcing this terrible action. We deployed the second of two shareable images on social media. And we sent out an email to our full file with this information. And so immediately we're out with all of this information. We're up on the phones also uh, with this information. And it's all tying back to the announcement of this happening and the fundraising ask, which was our first ask as soon as this uh, announcement hit um, that we were out with to, uh, to announce it to our constituents. So if we look at where we were out in the media right away, the, we were had a very concentrated media push to our uh, press audience too, which was, if you recall, one of our key constituencies, one of our key audiences. We were out in to the AP and a lot of these different, all of these different. Um, uh, media outlets with one um, long quote that was quoted in quite a few different places from our uh, from our president, which I'll let you read on the screen there. But the key takeaway here is that planned in advance, um, all of this 
all of these all of this messaging was ready to go all anybody needed to do was hit the start button or hit the launch button on all of these things as soon as we found out about the um, this development and that the next phase of the campaign needed to kick in if we look at phase two of the campaign through just social media, that's a screenshot of our blog. Our old blog looks brand looks much better now. We just redesigned mm -hmm. it. Check it out. Um, <laughs> check it out, defendersblog.org. Um, but that's a screenshot of our blog post that went up immediately as soon as that was announced. It also included the video of our president also included um, a, uh, all kinds of shareable links so that people could go on social media, share this shareable image, talk about how um, they supported Wyoming Wolves and opposed this measure, and you know, continue the conversation and really uh, sort of um, drum up the outrage about this action through social media. So that all happened pretty immediately after the uh, the uh, announcement happened also. I call the, this phase two second wave because as, as Bethany talked about, direct mail is a medium that requires much more lead time. You know, you can only reduce the lead time so far. The shortest you can squish it down is probably a week to two weeks in extreme cases from start of a um, from package creation to actually being in the mail. And then, you know, mail delivery can sometimes be a little bit erratic too, but we were ready to go with um, what we thought would happen when the actual delisting uh, was announced with placement in two of the next available direct mail pieces that we were out with. So our renewal number one goes out in September, actually very end of August, and so um, we had a we had held that a little bit and had a very very last minute insert that the mail shop was waiting on a go no go to insert into that package as soon as we got the word and so on August 31st we got the word they inserted this last minute uh, urgent alert the yellow insert you see there um, that talked about the Wyoming wolves being delisted so that was all ready to go printed we did it very cheaply so that it wasn't too much of a hit if we didn't end up using it um, and we're in the mail within just a day or two um, of the announcement happening the other thing that we did is our fall magazine that comes out, um, sends out, sent out on October 15th, had a wrapper around the entire magazine that talked about Wyoming wolf delisting. So we really made sure that every single audience, every single person that could engage with us as an organization was seeing this message across all channels and to the degree that we were able to and it made sense we were asking folks in one channel to engage through that channel but also to take an action in some other channel also which certainly helps spread the reach of the message but also helps folks engage in more and more channels which makes them more and more valuable more and more bonded to the organization so all in all in the campaign, what did we actually do here? So we reached um, within just a few days of the announcement over a million supporters, including 350,000 traditional donors, i.e. mail and telemarketing donors um, that support defenders in one way or another, and over 500 news outlets through all channels. We sent a whole lot of emails on this issue over the course of the entire campaign that took people to advocacy petition forms and asked people to share um, their um, support and outrage through social media. We reached um, almost 900,000 folks on social media using shareable images, rich media including video, cross-promoting social media sharing asks with petitions asks. Um, we engaged with and communicated with, kept up to date on a regular basis, over 37,000 mobile supporters throughout the course of the campaign, sending them to social media and to our blog and to the petition and asking them to support us with financial gifts. We generated over 1,100 personal comments to the state of Wyoming and to President Obama through petitions and through Facebook page postings, and we generated over 80 2,000 petition signatures just in the course of this campaign, which was probably about five, five and a half weeks in duration, 
Um, and more than 16,000 donors gave us over $300,000 to help for do, to, to further protect Wyoming wolves. Um, what's next for Wyoming wolves? We're currently engaged in a lawsuit, which we filed almost immediately after uh, Wyoming after the, the Wyoming wolf delisting was announced. And um, a lot of the revenue that we raised for the campaign is going towards fighting that and our other work to protect wolves in the Northern Rockies. Okay. So we have about six minutes left. I want to go over our um, key takeaways really quickly and then get to the questions. Um, and Michaela, I cannot see them on my secondary screen because of the uh, display. So if you, uh, after we go through these real quick, uh, could read those out, that would be awesome. I definitely can. We've got a lot of questions, so this may become a <laughs> yeah, and, rapid response question answering session. <laughs> and Josh, I would ask if you could strip the uh, names of our participants so that we can make sure we can get back to them in email if we don't get to their question. Um, if you can email that to Mikhail and I, I'd appreciate it. Um, so key takeaways that we hope you've gotten over the last 55 minutes here with us. Uh, Playing to a channel strength is the key to successful integration. I think that really came through in Michaela's case study, especially when you look at how they use direct mail versus social. Um, I think the, the social takeover of the president's Facebook page is brilliant. Um, mobile, absolutely the most timely channel. So really think about what you need a channel to do for you before you pick it as part of your media mix. Knowing and understanding your audience uh, is the ground groundstone of everything. So if you have a nonprofit where you are primarily serving those who are in the mature audience, um, mobile and social media are probably not going to be a gigantic piece of your mix. If you have a more widely demographically spread audience, um, you're going to have to work on segmentation so you know that somebody who is more Gen X oriented is still does email, direct mail influenced but not transactional, um, and that mobile optimization is important. Um, so really knowing your audience is critical. Michaela, you want to take these next three? Sure. So establishing campaign goals and milestones. If you don't plan it, you don't know whether you're going to be you're successful at the end of it. So it's really important to, to the degree that you're able to, even if you only um, are planning something in um, in theory or don't have complete information of exactly how something is going to play out, it's really important to establish campaign goals and milestones. Not only campaign goals for the organization, so how much money do we want to raise? How many petitions do we need? How many petition signatures do we need in order for this to be considered successful? But also, what is it that we want our constituents to feel? What do they want? How, how do they want to interact with us? How do we? What do we want to get out of this from a um, a constituent engagement perspective? Um, cross promoting milestones across like channels to optimum impact. You know, this is so incredibly important because um, in one of the earlier questions, maybe I can uh, can accomplish two things here. One of the earlier questions was, unless the donor indicates a preference, do you advocate restricting a donor to one channel only, or do you let them choose? And I would really say that the important key there is to offer folks the ability to interact with um, all of the channels that make sense as possible, and let them raise their hand and let you know what they're interest how they're interested in engaging with you. So allowing people to do what is most comfortable and what is easiest for them is really important and making and, and that will really be the key towards making your campaign go as far as it possibly can go. Um, tracking and measuring what worked for an even better campaign next time. Obviously, learning from your successes and mistakes is key to constantly evolving your campaign experience, not only from um, you know, reaching higher and higher from, a, from an organizational goals perspective, but also creating a better and better experience for your constituents, too. All right. So we are definitely going to have to answer a lot of these questions over email, and um, we can certainly send them to all of the, the folks who registered here, but if we can knock off a few um, here with our momentous two minutes left. Michaela, you hit the one from uh, my Michael McLaughlin, I believe. Um, yeah. 
So. And uh, next one uh, was, does direct mail have something on it now like opting out on telemarketing? So um, very similar to telemarketing, you can opt out of direct mail by either contacting the organization directly and requesting that they suppress you from their direct mail pieces, or there's a um, do not mail list, very similar to the do not call list that you can, um, that an that a, a individual person can join to have themselves suppressed out of direct mail and um, telemarketing calls alike. So there's nothing beyond that that I'm aware of. Um, DRTV, I think we already covered, direct response television is what that is. It's uh, video spots and with the goal of, um, that go onto TV with the goal of fundraising typically. Um, and it's a uh, fundraising program that many organizations engage in. Um, I'd say any one of the questions um, was any co comment on public television without any offer. Um, public, pub, there certainly may be other organizational goals that uh, that a program without a fundraising offer, um, such as DRTV has. DRTV is direct response television, so the response typically refers to a fundraising response. If an organization has a goal of um, uh, reach or um, Mission brand delivery. influence, message awareness, issue awareness, something like that. It could certainly be appropriate to do a, uh, a, a, a television campaign without a specific ask. Uh, but the, the fundraiser and the direct response person in me would say, why waste that opportunity to, um, to gather a tribe and to have people raise their hands and tell you that they're interested in your cause, whether it be by um, joining an email list or, or giving a donation or some other way that you can um, see who they are and uh, help, help them with the mission of the organization. Awesome. So we are right at 1.30 um, and we will answer the rest of the questions over email um, to the audience. Thank you so much for being here and staying engaged with us uh, and wish you the best of luck in your integrated marketing campaigns and uh, feel free to connect with Michaela or I on LinkedIn. We're always happy to answer questions and continue the conversation. Thanks so much everyone. Take care guys. Awesome. So uh, as I said, we've reached the end of our time for our sessions. So thanks for you for joining us and thank you Beth and Michaela for sharing your experience. Um, please note that if you will be joining us for the next conference session, you'll need to log out, go to webinar, and log back in to the next session. You can also go to our landing page to register for the rest of the day. So thank you guys, and uh, you can tune into the next, next session.